Section 17 of The National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Relations of Air and Water to the Temperature and Life by the Honorable Gardner G. Hubbard, President of the National Geographic Society. Circulation of Air and Water it was said in olden times the wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth that which was unknown science hath revealed the wind in its currents is governed and directed by laws as fixed as those of the solar system if a moisture laden wind passes over the country it leaves the land fruitful but a dry wind leaves it barren the currents of air are among the most important factors in the physical geography of our earth affecting not only soil and climate but also vegetal and animal life the winds obtain their moisture through evaporation which goes on everywhere and at all times in the equatorial and polar oceans from the rich cultivated soil and the arid desert from the valley and the snow-clad mountain recluse tells us that the evaporation from the equatorial ocean is from thirteen to sixteen feet a year this estimate is confirmed by the United States Geological Survey, which found the evaporation from the southern Colorado River to be 102 inches, or nearly 9 feet in a year. The quantity of water evaporated from the land must be very large, as only about two-fifths of the rainfall is returned by the rivers to the ocean. A great part, probably more than one-half of this quantity, is re-evaporated to fall the second and third time as rain. The movements of the atmosphere depend either directly or indirectly on differences of temperature. Without these differences, the air and ocean would be stagnant. There is a constant interchange of atmosphere between the equator and the poles. Cool air from the north blows toward the equator, first in a southwesterly, then in a westerly direction, crossing the Atlantic about the Tropic of Cancer. Cool air from the south blows in a northwesterly and westerly direction, and crosses the Atlantic near the equator. The difference of solar accession between the equator and the poles gives the northward and southward motion to these currents. The revolution of the earth on its axis gives the westerly motion. These air currents are the great trade winds which wafted Columbus across the Atlantic and Magellan across the Pacific. The trade winds of the northern Atlantic are about 20 degrees in width from north to south. Those of the southern Atlantic are not quite so wide. These winds oscillate northward in August and southward in February, following the sun. Between the trade winds of the north and the trade winds of the south there is a zone of calm. While the winds blow over the land, as well as over the ocean, their movements, interrupted by hills and mountains and affected by temperature, lose that broad sweep and uniformity so characteristic of the ocean. Return currents of warm air blow across the ocean from the torrid zone toward the northeast in the northern Atlantic, and toward the southeast in the southern Atlantic. The trade winds, or equatorial currents, blow around the world from east to west. The polar currents blow from west to east. The great ocean currents follow the same general course as the wind system. Their movements are initiated by differences in density, caused chiefly by temperature and by evaporation. Yet the larger part of the motive power is derived from the wind. These movements have been ascertained by years of observation on vessels in every ocean, sea, and gulf, by the cumulative evidence of drifting objects, some of which had their influence on the spread of vegetal and animal life, and even civilization itself, and by the researches of scientific exploring expeditions to polar regions and remote islands. These oceanic movements are as well understood as those of the great atmospheric ocean above us. When water has acquired its movement, the configuration of the bottom of the ocean and of the shoreline, the rotation of the globe on its axis, and the direction and velocity of the wind modify its movement. South America By this circulation, the equatorial waters of the Atlantic blow across that ocean, impinge against the coast of South America, and are deflected northward and southward. The southeasterly trade winds blowing over it become surcharged with moisture and pass directly up the valley of the Amazon, watering the earth with frequent rains for two thousand miles to the foothills of the Andes, where some of this moisture is deflected by the mountains southeastward to water southern Brazil. The remainder ascends the slopes of the Andes until it condenses and falls as rain and snow, 
and only dry winds blow across the comparatively narrow plains between the Andes and the Pacific. The vapor from the Atlantic falling of the rain over the valley of the Amazon, and along the eastern slope of the Andes and the Cordilleras, flows back to the ocean through the Orinoco, the Amazon and La Plata, and makes the interior of South America one of the richest countries of the world. The Amazon, a great Mediterranean sea, as it is often rightly called, is projected into the heart of the continent. Its total fall, from the foothills of the Cordilleras to the ocean, is not over 300 or 400 feet, affording for the largest vessels uninterrupted navigation and innumerable harbors for 1,500 miles into the interior, and 1,000 miles further for smaller vessels. The aggregate navigable waters of the main stream and its tributaries are estimated at 50,000 miles. The moist winds abundantly water the valley and modify its climate. Their influence in tempering the climate is felt directly more than 1,000 miles up the valley, and indirectly still further, through the shadows thrown by the clouds, and through the rainfall and cooling effect of the drops of rain falling from a high altitude. It is from 8 degrees to 10 degrees cooler than on either side of this rain belt, and it is more healthful than other equatorial regions. The tropical woods are so thick, and the creepers and undergrowth so luxuriant, that animal life is almost entirely confined to the trees above and the waters below. Nature has thus far been more powerful than man, who has struggled in vain to subdue this fertile valley to his use. The winds that pass up the valley of Rio de la Plata to the mountains of Peru, Bolivia, and Argentina are not so heavily charged with moisture as those of the Amazon Valley. Consequently, the thick forests and dense vegetation gradually disappear, and, instead of an inland sea, there are vast plains, or pampas, over which roam herds that could not live in the valley of the Amazon. Thus the difference in the rainfall changes the entire vegetal and animal life. Through the center of South America, from the Caribbean Sea to the Straits of Magellan, there is a vast stretch of lowland through which run the waters of the Orinoco, Amazon, and La Plata, with low divides between their valleys. A boat can pass up the Orinoco, thence by Casaquere River to the Rio Negro, a branch of the Amazon, thus through the Amazon and its branches to a low divide between the valleys of the Amazon and the Rio de la Plata. Here there is a carry of six or eight miles, and then continuing down La Plata to the Atlantic Ocean, the traveler may make a water journey of over 3,000 miles between the Cordillera and the eastern plains of South America. The easterly currents flowing from the Antarctic Pole are deflected by Cape Horn along both eastern and western coasts of Patagonia. On the eastern coast, the winds blow offshore, leaving that coast arid. The westerly current, as it approaches the tropics, is deflected further westward and forms the greatest of the equatorial currents. The moisture of the winds that blow over this Antarctic current is precipitated on the cool shores of Patagonia and Lower Chile, and these countries are correspondingly enriched, while the same winds continuing over the heated plains of Upper Chile, Peru, and Southern Ecuador are rarefied and take up what little moisture there is in these plains, to be afterward condensed and precipitated on the mountain slopes. From this cause, the western coast of South America for the 3,000 miles from Lower Chile to Upper Ecuador is dry and barren, and would be uninhabited except for the mines of gold and silver in the mountains, and the deposits of nitrates and guano along the coast and on the islands. Yet the rainfall in South America is greater than in any other part of the world, and more than twice as great as the rainfall in Asia. North America The northern equatorial current, less powerful than the southern, crosses the Pacific about the Tropic of Cancer, where it is deflected by Japan and flows northward as the Kuroshiwu Current, recrossing the Pacific in a northeasterly direction. The Pacific Ocean is so wide that it is doubtful if this current would reach the American coast were it not for the drift caused by the wind which blows across the Pacific with strong and steady force. When it strikes the shores of North America it is feebler and has a lower temperature than the Gulf Stream of the Atlantic Ocean on reaching the coast of Europe. The currents of wind strike the coast between the 50th and 55th degree of north latitude, the region of greatest rainfall, and are in part deflected northward and southward by the coast range of mountains. The remaining portion blows over the mountains and up the valley of the Columbia. Continental fogs and rains abound on these shores, and the coasts of southern Alaska, British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon 
are covered with the densest and largest growth of evergreen forest in the world. These winds prevail as far southward as the latitude of San Francisco, where the southeasterly trade winds commence and blow offshore, leaving southern California and the western coast of Central America a zone of calms, dry and barren. While the western coast of the continent is bathed by the waters of the Pacific, its eastern shores are washed by the equatorial current of the northern Atlantic, which flows around the West India Islands through Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico. The trade winds from the Gulf of Mexico water the eastern coasts of Central America and Mexico, and impinging on the mountains of the interior are deflected towards the north and east, over the southeastern states and up the Mississippi Valley, where they unite with the warm winds which blow directly up the valley from the Gulf of Mexico and water the valley of the Mississippi. The rainfall in the upper part of the valley is derived largely from the Rocky Mountains. The waters of the Pacific, carried by the winds and deposited on the Rocky Mountains as rain and snow, being again evaporated and carried eastward to fall as rain. This great valley extends from Canada southward to the Gulf of Mexico, and from the Rocky Mountains eastward to the Alleghenies. It is 1,500 miles long and 2,000 miles wide, the largest and richest valley of the temperate zone. A very low and narrow divide separates the Mississippi Valley from another great valley extending from the Rocky Mountains eastward with a gentle slope to Hudson Bay and the Atlantic. It is as long from west to east as the valley of the Mississippi is from north to south, and is from 500 to 600 miles wide. The western portion of this plain is drained by Saskatchewan River. The winds which blow over this valley from the Rocky Mountains in some years water imperfectly the western portion of this plain but with a copious rainfall the land yields abundantly. The eastern portion is watered from Hudson Bay, Lakes Winnipeg, Manitoba, and the other large lakes of the province. As the climate is cold, less rainfall is required than in the valley of the Mississippi. Another very low divide separates this valley from the Great Plain, 2,500 miles long, descending with a gentle slope to the Arctic Ocean through which runs the Mackenzie River. The winds that blow from the Arctic Ocean fall in rain and snow in this valley. Thus, through the center of America, from the Arctic to the Antarctic Oceans, there are no high elevations, while there is a more uniform distribution of rainfall and temperature than on any other continent. From the Arctic Ocean, cold currents of water flow along both the eastern and western coasts of Greenland, and bear immense icebergs and fields of ice southward until they meet the warm waters of the Gulf Stream, where the ice melts causing fog banks and depositing the debris brought from the Arctic glaciers, thus aiding in the making of the great fishing banks of Newfoundland. The Arctic current, still cold, runs southward inshore from the Gulf Stream and affects the climate of North America to the latitude of New York, if not to Cape Hatteras. From the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf Stream passes around Florida and flows along the southern Atlantic states. The currents of air from the Gulf Stream blow over slightly cooler waters and deposit rain on the eastern side of the Alleghenies and water the eastern coast of the United States. Europe The main Gulf Stream is deflected by the shape of the ocean bottom and the contour of North America, northward and eastward, toward Europe, but its drift is largely increased by the winds. The drift from the southward sets around the North Cape of Norway, 71 degrees north latitude, keeping the coast free from ice all the year round, and it is felt in the Kara Sea. It is by means of this current that Nansen hopes to be borne through the Kara Sea and from the Lena Delta by way of the North Pole to Greenland. The winds that blow over the Gulf Stream water the western coast of France, Great Britain, and Scandinavia, and temper the climate of these northern regions to such degree that Stockholm and St. Petersburg have become great cities, while in a lower latitude in Labrador, on the other side of the Atlantic, the country is so rocky and rough, and the temperature so intensely cold in the winter, lower than the inhabited parts of Greenland, that Labrador would be worthless and uninhabitable, except for the seals and fish. These currents are deflected by the coasts of France and Spain, towards the west, and are drifted in different directions by the wind, watering the eastern coasts of Spain and Portugal, but having precipitated their moisture, they leave the highlands of Spain dry, cold in winter and hot in summer. In the Mediterranean the evaporation is much greater than in the Atlantic Ocean. Its water is therefore salt and heavier. To supply this loss by evaporation, water flows from the Atlantic into the Mediterranean, 
from west to east as a surface current the projection of italy and greece into the sea deflects these currents along each coast of both countries the general course of the winds of southern europe is interrupted by the alps and apennines of italy and by the high mountains of greece land and sea breezes water these countries in august and september while the winter snow on the alps fills the italian streams in summer and irrigates the land through numerous canals a plain beginning in holland and belgium runs through germany gradually growing broader into russia where it is known as the black zone thence northwest through a large part of siberia it is low in the west gradually rising toward the east though in siberia its northern margin dips gently beneath the arctic ocean the western part of this plain is watered by the winds from the atlantic and from the north and baltic seas and the gulf of finland the eastern part of siberia is watered by the winds from the arctic ocean these plains are the granary of europe and siberia although a small part comparatively of the siberian plain is good for corn asia the regularity in the motion of the currents of air and water prevailing in the western hemisphere and the atlantic ocean is apparently lacking in asia and the indian ocean the mountains of america run northward and southward and have little if any effect in originating currents of air and none at all on the ocean currents in asia the largest and highest mass of mountains in the world runs east and west and from their foothills the great plains of india and china extend to the indian ocean and the china sea bringing a polar climate into close contact with the torrid zone cold winter winds blow from the himalayas and the high plateaus of central asia southwestward into indian ocean and china sea and drift the waters with them when the sun turns toward the north in the summer solstice and the plains in india and china become heated by the torrid sun the wind changes and blows toward the northeast at the meeting of the winds the monsoon breaks and the cyclones of india and the typhoons of china follow they are soon over and then the monsoon blows over indian ocean and china sea all india kashmir and western tibet further india anam and eastern china and japan are well watered fifty feet of rain falling in a year in some parts of india in these countries there are generally six months of rainy season and six months of dry in parts of india the water of the rainy season is stored in large reservoirs for irrigation in the dry season while in china numerous canals between the different rivers in like manner irrigate the land india and china are among the richest countries of the world and have the densest population though destined to be surpassed in the future by the population of the amazon and mississippi valleys we have thus seen the effects of the winds and ocean currents in modifying the climate and in enriching the great valleys of south america and north america of europe india china and japan deserts or basins about one-fifth of the territory in each continent is arid and desert land with one or two possible exceptions these arid regions are basins where the rivers and rainfall either run into salt lakes or are lost in the desert and never reach the ocean these deserts are caused by winds which blow either from colder over warm areas and are therefore dry or over vast plains or mountainous regions upon which they have precipitated their moisture the average rainfall on the great deserts does not exceed ten inches a year and the evaporation is usually greater than the rainfall they are situated generally between the twentieth and fortieth degrees of north latitude and between the twentieth and thirtieth degrees of south latitude in the northern belt are the carson and other basins of nevada the salt lake of utah the desert of sahara arabia persia the aero caspian desert the tenon gobi and the mongolia desert in the southern belt is the desert of antakama in south america kalahari in south africa and the australian deserts these basins in the northern belt contained formerly lakes much greater than are now found in either of the continents salt lake was formerly much larger and deeper for its waters once beat upon the shores one thousand feet higher up the mountain sides than at present its waters then found their way to the ocean this was probably in the ice age when the surrounding mountains were covered with snow and great glaciers and the evaporation was much less than the rainfall and the water from the melting glaciers in the deserts of sahara numerous dry water courses show where great rivers formerly ran into lake tihad in asia the caspian and aral seas were connected covering a territory many times greater than at present with an outlet to the bosphorus and mediterranean 
we have not sufficient knowledge of arabia to know the former condition of that arid country the process of desiccation is still going on and how much longer it will continue no one can tell mountains of america next we will notice the influence of the mountains on the atmosphere either in enriching or impoverishing a country or in intensifying the movements of the currents of air and water the mountains of america rise at the arctic ocean and form the divide between the mackenzie and yukon rivers a second range runs from northeastern alaska through mount st elias then these two bands extend through british columbia gradually widening as new ranges arise until they obtain a width of five hundred miles at the boundary line between british columbia and the united states and a width of one thousand miles on the line of the union pacific railroad these two ranges the sierra nevada and the rocky mountains come together in southern mexico and extend as a single range through central america and the isthmus of panama on entering south america this range again divides forming the cordilleran and the andes systems and thence they extend southward with a varying width between them from forty to two hundred miles they are connected from east to west by several cross ranges or spurs from southern chile the andes continues as one chain through patagonia and tierra de fuego to cape horn this is the longest and most persistent chain of mountains in the world the peaks gradually rise in height from north to south until in chile aconcagua twenty two thousand four hundred and twenty seven feet in height is the culminating point thence southerly the range generally lowers to an elevation of a few hundred feet only at the straits of magellan and cape horn several volcanoes in this long range rise to a greater elevation than any of the non-volcanic peaks in north america the currents of air from the pacific ocean in passing over the coast sierras and other ranges deposit a large portion of their moisture on the mountains between these ranges are warm valleys and the winds chilled in crossing the mountains evaporate the little moisture in these valleys and they are left dry and arid unless irrigated by mountain streams thus we have a succession of arid valleys and green mountain ranges moistened with rain and snow and rich in forests and vegetation a number of these valleys are enclosed basins from which the mountain streams have no outlet to the ocean and in some of which saline lakes are found mountains of asia in asia we have the largest continent the highest mountains the most elevated plateaus and the greatest extent of desert land in the world the pamir or roof of the world the abode of the gods as it was called by the inhabitants is a vast plateau of thirty thousand square miles area with a north and south extension of about four hundred miles and with a mean elevation of twelve thousand feet it is traversed by a high range of mountains culminating in the taghama twenty five thousand five hundred feet in height the pamir was the only barrier alexander could not pass now the english the russians and the chinese meet on this plateau and struggle for the control of asia from it branch all the great mountain ranges of asia the hindu kush range runs west through afghanistan between persia and turkestan along the southern shore of the caspian sea culminating in mount ararat thence as the caucasus mountains to the black sea while a spur of this chain follows the southern shores of the black sea to the mediterranean the himalayas run a little south of east from the southern part of the pamir for fifteen hundred miles separating india from tibet and china the kuen luen range sometimes considered as an extension of the hindu kush runs from the middle of the pamir through western and part of central china for twenty seven hundred miles the thian shan runs from the northern end of the pamir northeast separating tarim and mongolia from siberia as it approaches the ocean it turns toward the north and ends in kamkachka forming the great divide between the waters of the arctic and pacific oceans between these mountain ranges are elevated plateaus and the former dominate the rainfall and temperature of the continent the steeper slope of the mountains of asia is toward the indian ocean between the himalayas and quinluen ranges and running from the pamir east is the highest and longest plateau in the world varying from seventeen thousand to ten thousand feet its lowest elevation above this plain the mountains tower from four thousand to eighteen thousand feet their summits are covered with everlasting snow from eight thousand to ten thousand feet below their crests here is truly the abode of the snow 
this plateau from its height and position between two ranges of mountains is cold in winter and hot in summer this is tibet the land of the lama here all the great rivers that empty into the pacific and indian oceans excepting the yukon the columbia the colorado and the zambesi have their source in the western part of tibet the indus and brahmanputra rise one running west through a pass fourteen thousand feet in height into india the other running east through passes thus far inaccessible and unknown into india east of the headwaters of these two rivers rise the rivers of siam and farther india further to the northeast rise the great rivers of china the huang ho and yang si kiang their valleys are separated by high chains of mountains extending in a northwest and southeast direction the huang ho runs north and east through the temperate zone of china and the yang si kiang south and east through the semi-tropical regions of middle china as they gradually approach they enclose a great valley and become the arteries of the superabundant life of the empire the eastern part of this great valley watered by the winds from the china sea is crossed from northeast to southwest by parallel ridges from which numerous streams descend the valley of eastern china is thus abundantly watered and the rich soil yields bountiful crops for thousands of years this region has been the home of the chinese a self-dependent world it is a limited territory of one point three million square miles no larger than the valley of the mississippi yet it sustains a population of four hundred million or one-third of the people of the globe north of the kuen luen mountains and the valley of the huang ho and south of the thian shan is the plateau of the tarim sometimes called east turkestan it is much lower than tibet and is traversed by cross ranges of hills or low mountains through which flows the river tarim little rain falls on this plateau the sand from the desert is gradually covering the fertile valleys the ancient lakes are now little more than salt marshes and where formerly lived bands of huns and vandals that overran europe now only a few shepherds find a scanty living this part of the world seems exhausted without a shrub or tree or blade of grass and no longer fit for the residence of man it has become the sole home of the wild horse and the yak east of this plateau of tarim are the deserts of gobi and mongolia which extend far eastward toward the sea of japan a high range of mountains separating mongolia however from the sea coast so that only dry winds blow over these great deserts north of the thian shan and the altai mountains is the great plain of siberia it starts from a lower level than that of the tarim desert and descends with a gradual slope northwards for fifteen hundred miles to the arctic ocean these plains resemble in some respects the great plains of the united states but the latter slope toward the east and south with a climate growing continually warmer while the siberian plains slope toward the north the temperature growing continually colder the winds in summer blow from the arctic ocean over these plains to the altai mountains while in winter they blow from the mountains to the ocean there is a slight evaporation from the arctic ocean but the temperature of siberia is so low and the summers so short that the plains require comparatively slight rainfall to fertilize them there is a large portion of asia arabia persia turkestan including caspian and aral seas to which we have not particularly referred because it is entirely outside of the influence of either the monsoon trade or other moisture bearing winds this territory extends from arabia northeastward beyond the lake of balkash into siberia a vast extent of country larger than europe a dry rainless desert hot in summer and cold in winter part of this region is from six to seven thousand feet above the level of the sea part below the sea level yet neither height nor depression makes any difference in this arid land formerly sections of these countries were thickly populated the Aral and Caspian basins were once called the Garden of the World. In Mesopotamia were Nineveh, Baghdad, and Babylon. In Persia, Susa, and Persepolis. Historians tell us of great cities, flourishing empires, where now is only a barren and sandy desert. We do not know whether the climate has changed or whether in ancient days the country was thoroughly irrigated, and now through neglect has been buried deep in the sand of the desert. Although four-fifths of Asia are either desert or mountainous land, and are only scantily inhabited two-thirds of the population of the world are found within its borders End of section seventeen